Good afternoon, beautiful people. Welcome to my channel. Just was off for a couple of days there. Anyway, now I'm back in my seat. So, Rahu Ketu study part 9. One more thing about Rahu and Ketu, you got to understand. When you study Rahu Ketu, you got to study the axis, the entire axis of operation of how these two operate in our lives. Yeah. <clears throat> so, we need to understand dispositors first, the main planets that are ruling the houses and the color they will assume when it comes to the nakshatras, moon. Because both Rahu and Kesu, Ketu hate the sun and the moon. They have got a beef against them for whatever reason. They hate them, right? So they will imitate and act according to the dispositor and according to the color of the nakshatra. It's an imitator. It's a fake okay like they say in arabic it's haram okay it's something like that it's uh, not a very nice energy but that's something which you have come to play with it's a propensity that remains for life and we have to work that puzzle as soul so become a detective of your chart and this entire studies that we are going to do rotate the entire rahu ketu axis around the clock around the pie chart we will examine what exactly it does and why it does what it does. Okay? Become an investigator first. What is true, what is not true, what is relevant to me, what is not relevant to me in my life is kind of secondary. Let's not jump to conclusions. Let's not assume things straight away saying that, oh, this does not work for me or oh, this is not right. It, that's simply not the way it works. Okay? So for those who have seen the beginning, the introduction to Rahu and Ketu, you can skip that part, go to the pie chart where we discuss the axis. Now we are talking about the axis of Sagittarius and Gemini. What is this axis? It's the axis of Jupiter versus Mercury. It's the axis of teacher versus student. Gemini is everything student. Sagittarius is everything teacher. The teacher and student in a classroom, think of that dynamic. Where is the teacher coming from and where is the student in? That is Sagittarius versus Gemini. Now we are talking about that because Purva Ashada wants to achieve victory at all costs. I want to win this thing. I want to become this thing. I want to achieve this leadership. Achieving victory is the theme of Purva Ashada. Now that moves through Sagittarius, right? And then on the other side, it moves through Punarvasu and Ardra which do different things. Let's see what that is. Keep watching. So number one, the classical characteristics of Rahu and Ketu as described by the classical Vedic literature. Okay, What is Rahu and Ketu? These are the north and the south nodes of the moon found by the virtual points which are the intersection points between orbit of the moon around the earth and orbit of the earth around the sun. So basically if you take two Ellipses, ellipses, it will form two intersection points. Yeah, So these two intersection points are called the North Node and the South Node. They are virtual nodes, although they behave like planets and we shall see why in a minute. So who is Rahu? The symbols are there like a horseshoe and the reverse horseshoe. Right? This is typically how it is portrayed in Western astrology. So I'm using the same symbol here. Rahu is mythologically depicted as the severed head of a demon symbolizing constant, endless, insatiable hunger and appetite, be it sensual or physical, yet it is unable to hold on to or grasp it. Rahu is the one who constantly wants something. Think of it as a live head only, not the body. Okay, so it can't hold on to anything or be satisfied even if it gets that thing since it has no arms or body or stomach right? just a head which is alive this gives Rahu the title of Bhoga Karaka or meaning one who is after sensory materialistic pursuits so think any earth sign for example they want sensory materialistic pursuits or think any of the signs literally whatever they are after Rahu wants that and wants that very badly and goes after it with everything this is an energy in us by the way it is not a planet it's a virtual node but it will behave like a planet which we shall see why 
So it is unable to satisfy that hunger or hold on to anything even though it gets something. It wants to move on to the next and then to the next and then to the next. This is why Varahu is also called as the guy who wants foreign things, not of the native land or not of what the person is natively born in. Why? Because of that insatiable hunger. There is always insatiable hunger to go after one thing after the another without being able to hold on to it. That's Rahu. Ketu, on the other hand, is mythologically depicted as the severe body, the remaining half of the demon, symbolizing constant, endless, insatiable search for identity. It is looking for the head, but it doesn't have a head. So it is looking for that identity. Everybody's identity, ego is centered in the head, what you look like, right? It is also seeking for true purpose, sense of self. As a result of this, it tries to hold and grab on to everything that it can find its hands on because it has got hands. Ketu has got hands. It's trying to hold on to everything but it releases immediately because it knows that's not the head. It's like trying to grasp onto everything thinking oh I want this or I am this, I am that, I am this. Not getting any identity because it's not finding the head there. Since it has arms and walks everywhere, it goes around through life walking from place to place, people, situations, circumstances, but not knowing who or what it is. It doesn't have a head. This is why Ketu is referred to as Mokshakaraka or the seeker's path, the one energy in us which seeks something. That's why Ketu is called the Mokshakaraka. Now this is the classical interpretation. Okay. Now we shall see how this plays out in the modern interpretation. Very important to connect the bridges. Now here you have the Rahu Ketu general characteristics as modern interpretation. This I have borrowed from the book Light on Life by Robert Suvada. Excellent book. I have put it in the community tab if you want to go through it or purchase it and read it. I seriously suggest that. Okay. The North Node of the Moon, Rahu. What does it become because of the characteristics which classically is told in the texts? What does Rahu lead to in the modern context? Rahu is responsible for originality, individuality, independence, insight, ingenuity, inspiration and imagination on the positive side. Because Rahu and Ketu both love to explore foreign stuff, things out of the box, things not taught by tradition, Rahu and Ketu will be anything but traditional. Okay. Think of it as something foreign to the culture, to the way you are taught things. Looking for original stuff. If there is one singular force that is responsible for creating everything that we keep modernizing, so to speak, thinking out of the box, it is this. That's why it's important to pay attention to this. Okay, back to this. So Rahu on the downside becomes leads to confusion, escapism, neurosis, psychosis, deception, addiction, vagueness, illusion and delusion. This is the downside. Now how this plays out and why we will have to see individually in the charts. We will still see that. Okay, Ketu. Ketu, the guy with only the body, no head there, is gives us the feeling of universality, impressionability, idealism, intuition, compassion, spirituality, self-sacrifice, subtleness, on the positive side. On the downside, it can lead to eccentricity, fanaticism, explosiveness, violence, unconventionality, amorality, iconoclasm, impulsiveness and emotional tensions. This is on the downside. This is what it plays out and Rahu Ketu is typically an axis like it is shown over there, right? Rahu Ketu, let me remove myself for the time being from that axis, okay? There you are. So you see it as an axis okay 180 degrees apart and it can play out in any one of the opposite houses it can play out in 1 7 2 8 3 9 4 10 etc etc it can be, you'll see that later but this axis becomes a definition point of where in your life in your different houses are you looking for these two aspects and they are always opposite to each other as you can see okay to stand opposite to each other so if it plays out in second house it detaches itself from the 8th house. If Rahu is in the 2nd house, it, Ketu will be in the 8th house. You see what I mean? And so you will bring the 8th house aspect with these aspects shown here. 2nd house with that aspect shown over there. Of course, it plays out with something called as dispositors. We shall see that next. Now, if you go to a traditional Vedic astrology, they will go on and on endlessly about dispositors. What the hell is a dispositor? 
It's an invented term by the Vedic astrologers. It has no meaning of its own. It shows the disposition and what's the story on this. Rahu and Ketu both are enemies of the sun and the moon. This is the basic principle. So it has the solar aspect and the lunar aspect. The solar aspect is called the dispositor and the lunar aspect is the nakshatra which gives the entire characteristics in the ball game of Rahu and Ketu. Okay? The solar or the dispositor means since Rahu and Ketu are enemies with the sun and do not have a full identity of their own. Remember it's a virtual node. It is not a planet. They both do not have any planetary characteristic individually. So they take on the identity or the disposition of the lord of the zodiac sign that they sit in and borrow the attributes of the house from which that lord sits in. Suppose Mercury is in the third house. Okay. And Rahu sits in the house of Mercury somewhere else. So it will borrow the attributes of Mercury sitting in that third house and bring it to that particular house wherever Rahu is sitting in. Got it? Nakshatras. Since Rahu and Ketu are enemies with the moon and do not have a full identity of their own, individually, they take on the shade of personality. Nakshatra is essentially a shade of personality. It's coloring of a personality. It's seeing the world through different colored glasses. That they sit in and borrow the nakshatra traits and attributes which color their propensities. So Rahu and Ketu do two things at the same time. At the solar level, it goes with the dispositor, that is all of the planets, physical planets, Mercury, Mars, Venus, Sun, Moon, so on. So they take on the attributes of whichever house they are sitting. If it sits in Rahu sits in Cancer, it will you have to look for where Moon is sitting, which house, and what it is doing there, and even the Moon Nakshatra. If it is sitting in Leo, Rahu in Leo, that means it will you have to look for where Sun is sitting and which Nakshatra and which house. So it will bring those attributes. That's the way you have to analyze this. Okay. Let's see some aspects of which house they play in and why. Now there are some vital aspects that you keep, need to keep in mind when evaluating Rahu and Ketu because this is important for, especially for people who are sort of looking for self-development to understand where they are coming from. If you are not interested in changing yourself, this entire channel is useless for you. But if the other one who is interested in knowing what is happening in my life, where do I need to go, what are my talents and you question these kinds of things, excuse the noise somebody is drilling about. So then you need to understand these aspects. Now that's the typical chart, Indian chart. And house numbers are depicted as 1, 2, 3, 4, up till 12. Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha is there. And I have stuck Rahu Ketu as possible axis on the 1, 7. That is Aries and Libra. That is the top and the bottom. So either it can go to house number 1 or 7. Rahu Ketu can be reversed. It's okay. It doesn't matter. Or in 4 and 10. Now 1, 4, 7 and 10 in Vedic Astrology are given very vital importance because they are the foundational aspects that define who you are. That define how you operate in life, throughout life. So these become crucial. Why? The 1, 7 axis effects if Rahu and Ketu fall on there has a direct effect on your self and other concept. 1 and 7 is self and other. How you re relate to yourself and how you relate, look at the world around you as others including the spouse because seventh house is the house of the spouse but also others. So how you develop through life and how you develop a relationship with others. So it defines who you are in a very broad sense. One seven axis of Rahu Ketu. The four ten on the other hand, fourth house being the house of the mother, tenth being father, fourth being home, tenth being career. You see this has a you know all kinds of implications which define who you are. The 410 axis has effects on the heart versus mind. Mind wants to, is the one who goes out there in the world and being used in the career, right? You dissipate your energy as the mind in the external world. Heart is your home, your home center where you feel comfortable. Home is where the heart is, that kind of a thing. So heart and home is affected by this Rahu Ketu axis. Again, Rahu and Ketu might be reversed. Rahu might be in the fourth, Ketu might be in the tenth or vice versa. Same way with one and seven. But these are the vital relating aspects of Rahu and Ketu. Now what about the rest of the houses? 
Now, rest of the houses are called Trikona or Kona in Sanskrit, right? These are the things that come and go in your life. Let it be second house, third house, fifth house, sixth, eighth, ninth, eleventh, the twelfth. These are the things that come and go in our life, through life, through your entire life. These are things that are added into, subtracted from us. But this is not us. One, four, seven, and ten is us. Everything else is secondary, which revolves around you as life comes and goes. All other axes depict what attachments and detachments we have towards different areas of our life. That's all it is. They are less significant in terms of Rahu and Ketu when compared to 1, 7, 4 and 10 axis of Rahu and Ketu. Please remember this. When you are evaluating, you just have more propensity towards one part of life and less towards others. Rahu is attachment, Ketu is detachment. Rahu is expansion, Ketu is reduction. And they stand opposite to each other all this. Right? Now let's take the cases one by one. So we begin with Pada 4 as usual. The fourth Pada of Purva Ashada falls in the axis and we are going to directly jump to the Navamsha kind of thing. It falls between Taurus Scorpio axis, the fixed signs. So what this essentially tells us and the dispositors here being Jupiter and Mercury in the birth chart for all Navamshas. You can see all Navamshas have Sagittarius and Gemini and in Punar Vasu in the last Pada it goes to Cancer but that we have already covered in the previous one. So we will study now the Punar Vasu where it falls in the second Pada. Second Pada of Punar Vasu is going from Gemini to Taurus, going from intellectual knowledge having in the beginning Mercury wherever it falls in whichever house and going into translating it to materialistic gains later in life after 36. So this kind of individual will have will want will have a detachment from aspects of materialism later in life. Earlier in life they will have more intellectual capacity and yet detachment from it. Ketu is detachment from whatever it touches. But they have the talent for it. Don't misunderstand this. Ketu provides you the energy. That's why I have drawn the axis one way. Going from Ketu towards Rahu. You got to bring the Ketu energy towards Rahu in order to balance this. That's the only way to balance Rahu and Ketu. Okay. No amount of bells and whistles and going to 20,000 temples will help. Listen to me carefully. This is the only way you can balance this practically in your life. You have to work this thing practically. Conscious astrology. So now it goes towards Scorpio. Sagittarius going to Scorpio in Moksha. Meaning in the beginning they will all be Sagittarius in nature. Rahu being in Sagittarius wants to be like the Guru. He wants to be the Guru. This is like the fake Gurus that are floating around everywhere. I want to be able to teach everyone. I am the guru, I am the boss. I know everything. Little egotistical about teaching that kind of an energy. So they will do all kinds of accumulate bits and pieces of all kinds of information and they'll pretend they'll know everything. They'll come and do drama on YouTube, for example. This kind of Rahu does that. Rahu wants to become an unorthodox, greedy kind of mentality about whatever it touches in an unorthodox way, not mainstream. If a mainstream is going this, Rahu will go that way. Okay? Not like this, but that way. That's the tendency of Rahu. So in the beginning stages, in Purva Ashada, they will want to achieve, because Purva Ashada wants to achieve victory, right? So in this, it wants to achieve victory in the realm of education, wisdom, teaching, philosophy, higher philosophy. But later in life, in Navamsha, it goes into Scorpio. So it goes deep into understanding the hidden emotional aspects. that Scorpio 101. Hidden emotional aspects. That's what it's looking for in later stages of life. This particular axis. Now let's see what it does in the third Pada. In the third Pada, it goes into the Aries Libra axis in the Navamsha. So the same Jupiter and Mercury are doing it different style now. We are still talking about Purvashada and Punarvasu axis. Punarvasu axis is Punarvasu is more of a materialistic kind of people. These are people who are sharp, who are very sharp in mind. Mercury in Punarvasu becomes very very materialistic, smart, salesman, marketing, sales and marketing people who want to make a quick buck by selling something bogus to you. 
Punar Vasu is very good at that. Punar Vasu has got a theme of wanting to become Jupiter or wanting to become Guru in life. So this axis, in the second pada, what it does, it becomes Aries and Libra. Meaning Aries and Libra axis and Navamsha always should tell you it's about self and others. Is this a thing for me or is it, am I doing it for the society or for the people? Is it for my personal selfish gain or is it for the others also? It's about self and being selfless. That's the axis of Aries and Libra. You see, Aries, the Navamsha in Gemini goes to Aries in Punarvasu. And the same thing where Rahu is sitting is Sagittarius going into Libra. So these kind of people will want to have wisdom. They will have wisdom. They will learn a lot of things in life. See how the trans transition happens. Okay. <clears throat> so this kind of a axis of Rahu Ketu will be a completely different kind of person. Now this guy doesn't want to be a fake guru. What does he want to do? He wants to give it to the masses. He will want to teach. These kind of people make, may make good professors, lecturers in universities. Especially if the guru or the Jupiter is well placed. It, Jupiter is guru okay, in Sanskrit. So if Jupiter is well placed, exalted, see the dispositor list there. If it's in one of those houses, where is Jupiter exalted? Wherever Sun, Moon and Mars houses are present. Meaning... Wherever Leo is present, wherever Cancer is present, and wherever Aries and Scorpio are present, Jupiter does very well there. In many one of those houses, if it's present, it's already having a good strength. And then going into Libra, it'll do well there. Right? So this axis, the Jupiter wants to give things to the masses. It wants to give things to the public. On the other hand, it has to bring originality to it. Ketu has that Aries energy there. In Navamsha. So it wants to bring in a sense of originality. Aries is the original initiator, right? So depending upon wherever Mars is placed in Navamsha, Aries is the dispositor for that. And wherever Venus is placed in Navamsha and Rahu, right? This becomes that axis of clay. Wanting to bring wisdom as an initiator of something and initiate new kind of study in the external world. That's a wonderful thing, isn't it? Very revolutionary kind of teachers, professors in colleges, universities. We are talking that kind of an energy here. Now let's see what it does in second pada. Now in the second pada, Rahu in the second pada of Purvashada and Ketu in the fourth pada of Ardra. Now we are shifting gears. We have come from Punarvasu to Ardra. Punarvasu is interested in materialistic gains. So Ketu putting there will give you detachment from materialism and going into the teaching world, which we saw earlier. In Ardra, it wants to dig deep. Ardra is an investigator. Ardra make very good engineers, by the way. I've seen so many charts with good Ardra placement. They are all software engineers, telecommunication engineers, engineers of all kinds. Because Ardra loves to dig deep, go into details of things. This animal symbol for Ardha is a dog. You know, you see the dog digging deep into things, sniffing around things. It wants to investigate. Ardha is an investigator. So, Moksha Pada, it goes into the Artha. Moksha Artha, remember, we talked in the earlier videos also. You got to watch all of these videos if you want to make sense of Rahu and Ketu. Don't just see what your placement is, please. Because I'm covering in all kinds of ways that I'm getting individually. So I might not be able to cover everything in one go in one particular placement which is in your chart. You have to study the entire series, entire 27, 28, I don't know how many I'm going to make in this, in this playlist, yeah. Okay, back to. So it goes between, in Navamsha, between the Virgo and the Pisces axis. Now what's the Virgo and the Pisces axis about? Pisces is all about final emotional attainment. It's a moksha, final moksha sign, meaning it is the final fulfillment of emotion you get from anything in this world. Anything. Whereas Virgo is about getting into the nitty gritty, detailed, materialistic stuff of life. What do I need to do step by step? Virgo is a calculator. It calculates everything. You see, there kind of people, I want this, 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 and this. So how much do I add to get this? Or how much percentage are you giving me profit? That's Virgo. It's grounded. It's an earth sign. So Pisces and Virgo is a tussle if Rahu Ketu fall because Rahu Ketu always shows the 
tussle, the struggle between two opposing forces. Pisces and Virgo, you should think in terms of thinking that particular Pada, I mean. You should think in terms of now this person is trying to fight the battle of do I get emotional satisfaction out of something or do I get the materialistic satisfaction of something? Satisfaction is necessary for both Pisces and Virgo, but it is in different planes. So now we are talking about Jupiter and Mercury in the birth. And in the Navamsha, it goes into Mercury from Sagittarius, from Jupiter to Mercury there. And here, the opposite. So these people, one is going in Sagittarius to Virgo, one is going from Gemini to Pisces. So one is the birth chart, it is Rahu Ketu axis dispositor is Jupiter and Mercury. In Navamsha, it is Mercury and Jupiter. So later in life, these people might want to translate more in materialistic terms. Ah, forget all that wisdom, all that philosophy, all that talk. What do I need to do with all this BS in my life? I want to see what's real in my life. I want to see what I can gain. They become materialistic. They become the opposite later on in life. They have detachment from that wisdom that they have gained earlier on in life. See, Ketu goes from Gemini to Pisces, meaning whatever learning they have done earlier on in life, now they have detached from it. They said, I don't want to be bothered with this stuff. Detachment from wisdom itself. Many people tell, what the use of all this wisdom? You want money, right? You want a big bank balance. You want fancy cars. You want a fancy spouse, fancy house. So this is that kind where it goes from intellectual wisdom knowledge in the first part of life and after 36 years of age it flips. It goes the other way around. It becomes from spiritual to material kind. It becomes from emotional to material kind of satisfaction. So just between those two padas you see how much of flip of personality happens. Make sure you understand this properly. Okay? If you have something leave it in the comments. I'll look at your chart. Let's see the first pada of Purvashada. And Purvashada is about victory. So Rahu does very well in this. Rahu goes after whatever it wants and gets it. It's an obsessive mind. Okay. So now we come to the first pada of Purvashada, which is Leo and Aquarius. Access in Navamsha. Now Leo and Aquarius, what is that access about? What's the tussle or the push and pull between Leo and Aquarius. Rahu and Ketu, remember, I told you, it's always push and pull. You're moving away from one, you're moving towards the other. You're getting detached from one part of life, you are getting too attached to another part of life. Rahu is getting too attached, Ketu is getting too detached. In this Leo Aquarius, it's a tussle between father and son, that kind of an energy. Leo is the, ruled by son. Son is actually the father of Saturn in the mythology of Vedic literature. So Aquarius is ruled by Saturn, meaning what? You go from having the intellectual knowledge and wisdom in the beginning and now you are going into Aquarius in Navamsha. If you go to Aquarius in the Navamsha, your drive becomes, I want to give it all to the people. Very, very liberalistic kind of thinking. Very socialist, communist kind of thinking this is. Going from Gemini to Aquarius intellectual knowledge by the way and getting detached from it I know all the stuff but I don't want to, I don't really care about all these things and Rahu goes into Leo and Sagittarius to Sun Jupiter to Sun if it goes from Jupiter to Sun it this Rahu wants to translate and become popular fame Leo is about fame and recognition Rahu's dispositor, if it becomes Leo, the sun, it wants to achieve fame at all costs. And it will use that wisdom, whatever it has gained, for leadership. So Leo to Aquarius, this axis particular one, especially with Purva, Ashada and Ardra, Ardra wants to investigate, 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 find out the real reasons. Purva, Ashada wants to go and become victorious in something. So these guys can become very strategic planners very strategic coaches, business coaches and they might become very successful later on in life. Of course, you have got to see the dispositors and how they are working and where they are placed. Whether this person will actually do that or not. Rahu and Ketu will provide the energy for it, sure. But if the planets and the dispositors are not well placed in the chart, 
it will become something like a person is desiring something but never kind of achieves it. There are so many people desiring so many things, not everybody achieves it. What differentiates this achievement or non-achievement, you might say? It is the dispositors finally. Okay. Next we shall take up Mula. Mula Nakshatra. And which goes between Rikshira and Ardra. That's a very interesting one. We'll take that next. Take care. Be safe.